Alrighty guys, we're going to continue on where we left off, but I know there's going to be a knock on my door in a minute because another professor is coming by to have me help her with, uh, with the springboard. So uh, if you hear a knock on my door, that's what that is. Um, so uh, sun is releasing and emitting all of this radiant energy in the form of heat and in the form of light energy and is being um, absorbed by the earth and, and then released back up into the atmosphere in the form of heat and then plants are storing it in the form of chemical energy um, and this type of energy that they are uh, storing it in is called an ATP molecule it's basically like a free-floating rechargeable battery inside of all living cells and so None of the light energy from the sun can be used directly to fuel cellular work. It has to be uh, captured in the bonds of a molecule called adenosine triphosphate. That's what ATP is. Um, this is this free-floating, rechargeable battery-like molecule that temporarily stores the energy until it's ready to be used for cellular work in plants, animals, bacteria, and um, all the other living organisms here on Earth. Uh, so the structure of ATP, you can see what this molecule looks like. It's got its um, adenine here. Uh, the ribose is attached to that, and the phosphate group has these little phosphate atoms that have these high energy bonds between them. And so whenever uh, energy is needed by the cell, the adenosine triphosphate is going to separate off one of those phosphate groups and break that bond. And in the process of that bond breaking is when it releases a large amount of, of energy. And then the ATP becomes ADP. Adenosine triphosphate, tri-3, uh, becomes adenosine diphosphate or uh, two phosphates. So you can see the difference here between the phosphate groups uh, where this one has three, so it's got that potential energy right there. And then when it's released, uh, then the phosphate groups just have the two. Um, so uh, interesting about this is that photosynthesis is going to be the process by which uh, energy from sunlight is used to make food um, in all different types of plants. And so kind of imagine, uh, amazing to think that all, there are all these different types of plants out there that have all of this um, all of this energy that they're capturing from the sun and turning into chemical bonds. Um, so they are building themselves with this energy that's coming from, uh, from the sun. And so in the big picture of photosynthesis, a plant can go from a very tiny little seedling all the way up to uh, you know, a giant tree and all of that mass is coming from somewhere. And usually students um, don't think about where this, uh, this mass is coming from. It's actually being pulled directly out of the air in the form of carbon dioxide and um, energy from the sun and then uh, water from the rain. And so uh, the vast majority of photosynthetic organisms, however, are found in the water because our Earth is covered with more than 75% water and um, is very important in uh, is uh, the water uh, uh, photosynthetic organisms are very important in um, creating most of the oxygen that uh, that we are breathing. And so when you hear about people saying, oh, you know, uh, keep our oceans clean or talking about uh, polluting the oceans, um, as we kill off more and more of those photosynthetic organisms, we start to kill off the things that are producing the oxygen um, that we need in order to survive. So most photosynthetic organisms are going to be extremely small. You can see the first three types. Um, this one is euglena, often found in freshwater. Um, it's a photosynthetic organism. Dino, uh, cyanobacterium is uh, going through um, photosynthesis. It's a, it's a type of bacteria. Dinoflagellates uh, make up a large amount of plankton, and um, as you can see, they have these uh, these flagellum that come off the come off the back of them, so that they can swim around. And then the large ones that you can directly see are uh, photosynthetic organisms like kelp. Um, in the big picture of photosynthesis, 
we have two things being uh, being input and two things being produced. Or I'm sorry, three things input, two things produced. So the things that go into a uh, seedling plant, we have sunlight, which is the energy. We have water, uh, which is H2O. And we have carbon dioxide, which is CO2. And so it's... Uh, Going into the plant and the photoreactions are where energy is captured uh, and stored from the sun. And then the synthesis reaction is where energy is used to build up sugar molecules. So the inputs are sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide. The outputs are breathable oxygen and sugar molecules. So photosynthesis takes place in the chloroplasts of these plants. The organelles are found uh, in the plant cells. That's why um, if you look at this cross section of a leaf, you've got um, just a small number of, uh, a number of cells deep is the leaf. It's very thin because the, you have the top of the leaf and then the photosynthetic cells uh, packed with chloroplasts are all packed tightly together and the bottom edge of the leaf because those things are going to be exposed to the sun and are going to go through photosynthesis. So that's why leaves are not uh, super, super thick. They're thin because all of the cells need to be exposed um, to the sunlight in order to make up the sugars for, um, for the plant's fuel. And continuing on, uh, a closer look at the chloroplasts. This is what they look like. Um, we looked a little bit at this uh, on Tuesday. He said that it looked kind of like a green chocolate chip cookie. Uh, we have our thycaloids, which are the place where the photo reactions take place. So these are all going to have to directly be exposed to the sun in order to harvest that light energy and convert it into chemical energy. Then we have our stroma, which is the location of the synthesis reactions. Synthesis, meaning they are making up the sugars uh, inside of the cells. So photo and synthesis takes place in the thycaloids and the stroma, and those are found inside of the uh, chloroplasts in the cells of a, uh, of a plant. So um, one of the interesting things to think about when it comes to plants is what a great diversity of plants that we find uh, around the world. We've got... Uh, some plants that are very well adapted to living where there is very little water, um, if you think of like your cactuses, those are going to be able to survive because they don't have the thin broadleafed uh, leaves. They have the little spikes um, so that a cactus is not going to lose water to the very arid uh, climate. Um, as the uh, earth is starting to uh, warm up, I believe that we'll start to see some plants doing some migrating as they're going to start to do better in other environments and do worse in some that they had always been in. So um, this is really a, a challenge for sustaining agriculture uh, because these plants, especially like here we have corn plants, take so much water in order to uh, maintain and it makes it so challenging uh, for the farmers of the world. And if we were to lose crops of corn like this, uh, then food production could become under unpredictable. And um, if you think about it, if we didn't produce any food in one growing season, the risk of starvation here on earth would be extremely high. Everything would be competing um, for those, uh, those plants. And so uh, we see different types of evolutionary adap adaptations uh, where some plants are going to thrive in, in hot, dry conditions, um, and they're going to have adaptations on them that help to reduce evaporating um, water. And so uh, your, your cactuses and your plants that don't have those big, green, lush uh, leaves that are very, um, that are, uh, very prone to losing water from them, um, the Plants in these types of conditions are going to have um, adaptations such as uh, stomata, uh, which are these small pores that are on the underside of leaves that make it so that um, they open up and allow some moisture to transpire from them. So here is a picture of what those stomata look like. These are the pores for gas exchange in plants. 
So th in this one, the stoma is open and um, it's allowing gases like CO2 and oxygen to be exchanged. And in this one, the stoma closes up. So just like you have pores on your face or if you look at your nose under a magnifying lens, you can see pores on your nose. Um, all plant leaves are going to have these pores that allow for gas exchange, for carbon dioxide to come in and then for 